right, and we are now live. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our third virtual Red Bench of the season. Um, I am Abby. I'm the director at the Vermont Ski and Snowboard Museum. Uh, tonight, we have an expert panel that will be discussing Nordic skiing, then, now, and into the future. Uh, I'm going to hand this over to Peter shortly, but first, I just have a few announcements to go through. Um, the museum is a member and donor supported organization. For those of you that may be joining us for the first time tonight, we have a physical location in Stowe, Vermont. Our goal at the museum and with our outreach is to collect, preserve, and celebrate the rich history of skiing and riding. Our Red Bench Speaker Series takes a current approach to our mission to bring you topics relevant to skiing and riding today. And this series is sponsored by Sisler Builders and Vermont Ski and Ride. In previous years, these events have been held at the museum with a $10 admission. Um, a lot has changed since our last gathering at the museum, and we wanted to provide the option to attend these events free of charge. Um, we all need little pockets of joy that we can look forward to these days, and I hope that these events are providing that for you. With that said, I mentioned we are a member and donor supported organization, so we hope that if you do have the ability to support our work financially, you decide to make a donation. Um, for every $10 donation received as a result of this event, you'll be entered into a raffle to win a pair of Darn Tough socks. I'll raffle off two pair. If you've already donated prior to joining in tonight, I do have record of that, you'll be included. Uh, the winners can choose between hiking socks or snow socks. So if you donate $10, you get one entry, $20, two entries, $30, three, and so on and I will draw the winners over the weekend to give you plenty of time to make those donations. Um, we also have our autumn membership drive, which is still active. If you've been meeting to join the museum but haven't yet done so, now is the time. So with every new member, so you have never been a member of the museum or it's been years since you've been a member, um, if you join, you'll receive a pair of Darn Tough socks. If you are a current member, if you upgrade your membership to the next level, you'll also receive a pair of socks. Um, membership benefits include savings at participating Vermont ski areas, touring centers, golf courses, retailers, lodging properties. You also receive 15% off in our gift shop, and most levels receive free admission to over a thousand museums across the country. Um, I hope that many of you decide to join, support our work, and enjoy the perks of being a member. Okay, my last announcement for the evening is something we've been working on for months and we are finally about to launch it. Um, as many of you may be aware, uh, with most other businesses and organizations, we had to cancel our Hall of Fame event this year. And with that, our most successful fundraiser, the Hall of Fame silent auction. So we've decided to bring the auction online and the bidding will open this coming Tuesday. There's an assortment of new gear, skis, snowboards, accessories, vintage items, memorabilia, and so much more. Um, and this is gonna be our most important fundraiser for this year. Uh, the website will be available to preview this weekend. And I hope that you participate, find some goodies for yourself, or maybe do a little holiday shopping. All right, let's get a little closer to getting this discussion started. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the discussion. So if you have questions, write it into the Q&A box and we will try to get as many as those um, as possible at the end. Um, I'm going to let Peter introduce our panelists, but I do wanna thank them each for joining us tonight from all over the country and as far away as Norway. Um, we certainly would not have been able to host this panel in person and I'm grateful that with the power of the internet, you could all be here tonight. Um, our moderator for the evening is Vermont native and museum board member, Peter Graves. Peter has held numerous positions in the sport of Nordic skiing over his 40 plus year career, ranging from coaching with the US ski team, serving as head coach for six seasons at Harvard, but perhaps he's best known for his long career as a television and stadium announcer. Peter has covered 11 Olympic games, beginning with a stint at ABC TV Sports as a cross country skiing commentator quite the experience. And with that, I hand this off to you, Peter. Thanks very much, Abby. And uh, wanna thank our great panel, very distinguished panel from around uh, the nation uh, and the world. 
uh, and to this continuing uh, Vermontsky and Snowboard Museum Red Bench series. Uh, tonight, our topic uh, is looking at the future of Nordic skiing. And uh, I'm going to begin uh, by introducing our panel here. Uh, and first, we introduce uh, Keegan Randall, the 2018 Olympic gold medalist, along with Jesse Dig. Keegan, Keegan is a Keegan is a Keegan is a seven, 29 World Cup podiums. She's been on five Olympic teams, and she joins us from her home in Penticton in British Columbia. Good evening, Keegan. Nice to have you with us. Good evening. Also Good joining us tonight. From Haley, Idaho, is the current head coach and program director uh, for cross-country skiing of the U.S. team. He's been at his job uh, for 10 years, seeing the U.S. program through a period of growth and success. He is also a chairman of the FIS World Cup Committee, and uh, we'll be asking him questions about the fist tonight from his home in Haley, Idaho, Chris Grover. Chris, thank you. We also have with us tonight a longtime and legendary coach from Stratton Mountain School and SMST2. Um, he is, was at Stratton Mountain School for an amazing 39 years, himself a legendary coach uh, and a longtime figure in the sport. We welcome Sferi Caldwell. Hello, Sferi. Hey, Peter. Thanks. You're so welcome. Uh, our next panelist is a native of Bennington, Vermont, who began competing on the FIS World Cup back in 2001. This is Andy Newell, three podiums on the World Cup, um, certainly cut his teeth as a great, great sprinter. He's a four-time Olympian, and he joins us tonight from Park City, Utah. Hello, Andy. Hey, everyone. Uh, we're also fortunate to have, uh, and I'm sporting the wonderful white beard, from his home, uh, well, not quite in the North Pole, but close by, Fairbanks, Alaska. Uh, we're fortunate to have one of the true, uh, I call him a sage uh, of the sport. Uh, he has seen it all and done it all. He's been an athlete, a college coach, a U.S. ski team coach, race organizer, FIS, TD, just to mention a few, Olympic official in Salt Lake City, and uh, brings a unique perspective, as always, to the sport. Hi, John Hestel. Thank you. And uh, then uh, I think we've got everybody but uh, the former Harvard athlete who brings a fresh and current perspective to the sport. He's been in his job uh, for a number of years at the Craftsbury Nordic Center. He is an FIS TD and serves Craftsbury uh, very ably as the chief of competition for races at the Craftsbury Nordic Center. And we welcome Ollie Burris. Ollie? Happy. Thanks for having me. And congratulations on your, on your recent new arrival. And finally, we're very lucky to have with us from his home in Norway, uh, outside of Oslo, uh, where it's early in the morning and we appreciate so much that he has stayed up and had an extra cup of coffee. Uh, he brings a broad perspective to the sport. He's been a longtime journalist. Uh, an Olympic announcer, covered many Olympic games in both cross-country skiing and biathlon. Uh, we got to know each other working at Salt Lake in 2002, doing the PA announcing, and again at Holman Colon in uh, 2011. Uh, the very much in-demand journalist and great announcer, Shell Eric Christensen. Hello, Shell. Hi, Peter. Nice to be with you guys. And I guess I have to say good morning uh, to right. you. It's one o'clock in, in the night. <laughs> yeah. And welcome to all of you. We're really glad to have you here. Let's get right into it. COVID-19, the virus has been on everybody's mind for uh, quite some time now. And uh, of course, we all hoped it uh, would be abated by this point. Clearly, it has not. Um, so let's get right to it. And first, we'll open it up with Shell, because um, there are a lot of changes uh, to the international scene uh, regarding uh, COVID. What are you seeing from a European perspective, Shell? Well, it's uh, nobody's sure about anything. That's uh, that's the biggest thing. That, uh, but uh, last week, as uh, 
as you all know, FIS ended up with the more or less uh, World Cup uh, schedule that was planned from the beginning. But I'm sure there are going to be changes. I was talking yesterday with Dresden, Germany. They're going to organize. In Norway, uh, they have a plan B from the Ski Federation that if the World Cup is cancelled, they're going to have a Norwegian Cup televised uh, throughout the season. Uh, so I was just writing an article about this uh, Nordic uh, Scandinavian junior match we have every year where USA normally are invited. This has been cancelled. Uh, the Youth Olympics in Europe has been cancelled, so there are a lot of cancellations, but so far the World Cup is scheduled more or less like it was planned. And Shell, do you think uh, it's possible there could be further changes as we get closer to the season? Uh, the problem now is that the COVID has come back to Europe. Uh, Oslo is just now the worst city in Europe. <laughs> Uh, so the restrictions are coming back uh, and that is not good of course. I am the project manager for the no latest tour of Norway cycling which is a world tour event over four days in August. We had to cancel uh, and we had to cancel mostly because the, we couldn't get the athletes into the country because between the countries in Europe now there are a lot of restrictions how you can travel, where you cannot travel and uh, it's going to be difficult. You can see the difference what FIS have decided and what IBU for biathlon. They have, uh, they have chosen to stay two weeks in each place and they have cut out big names like Rupalding, uh, Le Grand Bonnard, uh, Östersund. They are all out of the program at the moment and they have only decided till the end of January. Okay, thank you, Shell. Uh, Chris Grover, let me go to you on the same subject. Uh, as a chair of the World Cup committee, uh, I suppose uh, the decisions you made were the only decisions you could uh, make. Uh, but uh, tell me what's uh, going on from your perspective regarding COVID. Yeah, Peter, can you can you hear me? I'm having some problems with my connection. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Yeah, it was an interesting interesting meeting that we just had with the FIS. Um, I don't think so much that the FIS Cross Country Committee and the, and the nations had so much say in what the calendar was at this point. Um, we were, we pretty much uh, got the calendar that we got from the, from the FIS staff. Of course, it was a calendar that was decided uh, previously uh, in the previous fall and in the spring. Um, I think like many of us, we were a little bit surprised that we could still go to every venue. Um, but basically what happened was that the different nations and the um, different organizers came back to the FIS and said, yes, we are still prepared to host this event. We are working on special permissions to allow athletes from all nations to be able to come directly into our country. This is Olympic level sport. It's the highest level of sport. We, we want to make these dispensations to allow athletes to come in. With, uh, with, of course, many safety protocols, many testing protocols, there's uh, going to be an exorbitant amount of testing um, that happens at the World Cup level. And, um, and so right now we are, we're pushing forward. We're pushing forward with the schedule. And um, I think the FIS is pretty bullish on the whole thing. They, they feel like we can be a leader we can be a world leader in terms of sport, in terms of keeping people safe and, and demonstrating to the world community what it looks like to be responsible sports persons. And Chris, uh, don't want to put you on the spot here, and we haven't talked prior to this, but, but I, I want to ask, do you, is your plan for the U.S. team fully formulated as to, I mean, are you going to be over there for five months uh, or – it's not going to be easy to come back and forth, is it? No, it's no, it's not. I mean, we we are we are planning on taking full teams to World Cup, full teams to World Championships. We sincerely hope that the World Junior Championships and U23s get scheduled, rescheduled in some sort of format somewhere because we want to we want to have a full team there. Um, we feel that you know we have athletes that have been isolated in the U.S. in their home clubs and areas, uh, preparing now for, <laughs> for months upon months. And being able to race is the one carrot that we have kind of at the end of the, 
at the end of the day for all of these athletes and it's it's such a huge motivator so we we plan on we plan on uh racing as much as we can race and we have um pretty intricate and well-developed safety protocols from u.s ski and snowboard and from our u.s olympic and paralympic committee they're going to help guide us through this process and uh, and keep everybody safe and uh, and make sure we protect those that are around us all right, Chris, thank you. I want to ask Keegan now, Keegan, I, I can't remember how many interviews I, I've done with you over the years when in uh, late October or something, you said, well, I'm packing up to, and leaving tomorrow for five months. Uh, you know what it's like over there as well as anybody does. Um, what's your perspective on, on what this virus and the pandemic globally, how does that affect the athletes? Oh man, well, I've, I've really been in the midst of this discussion on a global level, um, given my position within the IOC Athletes Commission. So, you know, back in um, March and April, when we were trying to make a decision around what to do about the Tokyo Games, I was in contact with a lot of athletes who were in, literally in the final phases of their preparation. And to, to know, to have, to have been in that position so many times myself, knowing you're about ready to see all that work pay off, only to have that uh, moment, well, at least punted uh, a whole year ahead, my heart just goes out to every athlete. And, you know, I think we were all hopeful that for our winter sports, just given the time, we would get to a better place. And, you know, I'm happy to hear that things are still moving forward and we're all uh, hopeful, but it's definitely going to be challenging, I think, for our athletes. It's always a big deal to go to say goodbye to home and pack, pack up and go over there for five months. But now it's going to be just that much more challenging to, uh, to you know, see family members intermittently through the season. Um, but at the same time, you know, our, I think our athletes, from what I hear, have been training better than ever. Um, they're hungry. And, uh, you know, our American team is used to being resilient in many different situations. So this may come, come to our strength this year. And I think just as long as the number one priority is keeping our athletes safe, uh, I hope we can have a great season that can inspire everybody. Thank you, Keegan. Andy, would you have any uh, uh, second thoughts about uh, racing overseas during this time? Um, I mean, I can answer this question from the perspective of domestic racers who are the athletes that I work with most. So these are, I'm a club coach now with the Bridger Ski Foundation. Um, and in a typical summer, I would work alongside Brian Fish um, in the NTG and NEG camps and stuff. And so I kind of see the, the developing groups and the, the club's um, perspective on COVID. Uh, and I think a lot of athletes are frustrated because they feel like their path to the World Cup might be stunted a little bit by this uh, virus, for example. Um, I think it's going to be, um, I foresee the FIS World Cup, you know, happening a little bit smoother than any domestic style races that we have. Um, but I think all the organizers in the different regions in the U.S. have seem to motivate and come together pretty well to try to organize more domestic style races, which I think is great. I think it's going to be a weird balance this year between um, making sure our athletes here in the U.S. develop and get enough races. Um, and by doing so, they're going to have to do a lot more regional races and stay focused on just racing as much as possible, just like Grover said the national team will be doing. I've had athletes ask me like, oh, Andy, should I just take the winter off and just train and like train for the Olympics next year? my usual answer is no I wouldn't recommend that I think you want to try to race as much as possible that's a, a important piece of your development is having a season's worth of racing and so from a club club level we're going to try to do as much racing domestically as we can and then hopefully head to Europe um, I'll be on the trip uh, hopefully to the world junior U23s um, and helping coach that trip so I'm really excited about that to um, work with Team USA on that thank you very much I want to go to either John or, or Sperry on this. I mean, um, this has put a lot of things in perspective. Of course, uh, it came on suddenly. There really hasn't been anything like it. But, well, you know, just around my little corner in the upper valley here, um, the clubs are going very well. And it shows some measure, I think, of wonderful resiliency that the sport has. John or Sperry, both of you, any comment? There you go. Oh, okay. Um, thank God we went to clubs. That's all I can say about 10 or 12 years ago. Yeah, yes. we've, had a, we've had great training here. And for instance, our T2 team 
half of them are on the U.S. team. So usually we schedule things so that they can go to U.S. team camps and, and all that. And this year, they're just here training together the whole time. And we've had to be as careful as possible with COVID. But on the flip side, we've had a great training group for a long period of time. And so we've been able to just slowly build up throughout the whole summer and now into the park. And it's, it's great. And everyone's just kind of, I mean, our mantra is kind of, you only can do what you can do. So what's the goal? The goal is to get as fit as you can and to be able to ski as fast as you can. And that never changes. So that's kind of how we're looking at it. We're training to become as fast skiers as possible. Thanks, sir. John, yeah. any thoughts? Yeah, in uh, Alaska, all of the major clubs are continuing to train. They have their own safety protocols and health protocols that they're following. Um, but I have, haven't heard any coaches say, no, we're not going to train or, or we're going we're gonna, to you know, stay 10 feet apart or whatever. Um, but I think, uh, you know, from, from the organizer standpoint and the statewide standpoint, I think, uh, as Andy said, uh, we're looking in terms of our racing schedule, we're, we're, we're planning the season as though Alaskans will not be able to travel to races outside. So uh, a number of our races that are normally just national ranking list events, we're gonna turn into FIS events. And we're hoping that, especially in the first half of the season, when the fist points are important for selection, that uh, we'll have some real good opportunities for for fist racing in Alaska. Um, right, I John. think for the for the higher level skiers, uh, I think they you know they've done so much training and they haven't had the opportunity like the APU skiers haven't gone up to the glacier and the, they haven't gone to national camps and that sort of thing. Uh, so I know like Tyler Cornfield and Rosie Brennan have been taking periodic trips around Alaska on their easy weeks and trying to find new places to train and new experiences uh, just so they can stay fresh, which I think is, is really important and I think shows uh, good judgment from them. Thanks, John. Uh, Andy, I want to ask you a question with some of the athletes that you work with. I, I have wondered about, in lieu of uh, with this virus going on, and I'm going to shift gears very quickly. Are people overtraining now? Is there is there a risk in that because they they're wanting to fill up their time with, you know, a meaningful uh, pursuit? Are they doing more than maybe other years? Uh, that's a good question, uh, Peter. Um, I think you'll notice a lot of athletes because the ski the ski season of this in the spring was cut short. Most of us didn't do any racing after middle of March last year, you know, at, at the very latest. Some people didn't even race at all in March last year because of COVID. Uh, and I think because of that, a lot of athletes rested early on and then maybe got a little too ambitious in April. Typically, April is a month where skiers don't train massive hours. And so that's something I've tried to work with with different athletes that I've talked to is making sure um, we don't get too ambitious early on when we have so much more free time to train. Um, but at the same time, like, like what Keegan, Keegan's mentioned and Sperry, um, it can be weird as an athlete to not know what your schedule holds for the winter, basically. And it can be easy to lose motivation when you don't know if U23s is happening, for example, or World Juniors. So if you're in that age group, it can be tough to stay motivated, um, which is why here in the West, we are able to drive and connect with a few different clubs. So that's what we're doing right now. I'm in Park City. We've already had a number of training sessions with the Sun Valley group uh, and the University of Utah. Um, we're here training with, um, so we have guys like, you know, the, bo the boys, Gus Schumacher and Luke Yeager and uh, Johnny are all here. And we'll be doing some time trials with them this weekend uh, with the BSF group. So we're just trying to find ways to train together and do it safely. And we can do that easily driving. Um, but yeah, right now, most of the folks I'm, I'm working with um, seem on track and I think it'll be interesting to see at the World Cup level how hot, you know, people start the season and whether people are really, really fine-tuned in November or not. Okay, thank you. Ali, um, I don't know uh, how formulated all your plans are. I suspect uh, you've got a pretty good idea what you're going to do, but I mean, you're, you're a race organizer at Craftsbury, wonderful, wonderful site. It's put on great events. How do you feel you're going to 
do you have a, a, a genuine idea of how you're going to get through this winter, or is it too early to tell yet? It's going to be different. I think that's the the one general idea that we have. Uh, though I think we've we've, I mean, for a long time um, we were uh, we were hoping, like everybody, that things were going to get better, and then I think towards the end of the summer, um, sort of writing's on the wall. And so we started to formulate for, you know, plans for the, the existing reality, let's say, like how bad it is right now. Things get worse than things can always change, but our, our touring center um, is still in a pretty decent position to operate. So we're just gonna close buildings to the public and we'll groom and people can change out of their cars and it'll be a lot more old school. I think that might be like the best way to describe the whole vibe. Racing is going to get a lot smaller up here. Um, I work with the New England Nordic Ski Association. I worked, I was on a Zoom with Sferi the other day trying to set up our regional race schedule. Um, and I think a lot of events are going to get a lot smaller, which is a bummer. But also, um, I keep trying to convince myself there's a silver lining to all this, that we're going to have a ton more just general participation in skiing, which I think is positive for the racing community because it just gets more people interested in our sport. Um, I think it's going to be a great thing that families want to do with their young kids because you can be outside. Uh, so, you know, who knows if in five, six years we see this groundswell of a ton of, ton of skiers. So that's, I'm trying to convince myself that that's happening as I'm like cutting races and setting caps on participation and telling people that they can't talk to their friends that they haven't seen because it's not safe. So, um, yeah, that part's a bummer a little bit. But I would say our general loose idea is things are going to be different and a whole lot smaller. We're just going to try to stay stoked and make it work. Okay, Ollie, uh, thank you very much. Uh, for those that are participating, we want to remind you, you can leave us uh, a, a question. And if you want to direct it to somebody, put the, the attention uh, to a person and uh, we'll try to answer that. And we'll start doing that at the eight o'clock hour. Um, Shell, I want to turn to you, and this is sort of like peeping through a keyhole here, because I, I'm curious what you have to say about, uh, you followed this sport a long time, what, what can you tell us about how the U.S. cross-country effort is perceived overseas? Uh, uh, we had a uh, magazine like the Wall Street Journal of Norway that came over to our nationals in Houghton uh, this year and wrote a big feature story on it. What's your What's your uh, take? I mean, there's got to be more respect there uh, <laughs> than there's ever been, and and uh, here you have some people that have helped uh, make that happen. Well, you know, in uh, in our countries, uh, cross country skiing is a national sport, so. They are very, very famous. They are probably some of the most famous sportsmen and women we have in our countries. Uh, there is a there is a, a program reality going now on uh, Norwegian and Swedish television called uh, the Sweden versus Norway, which is like, uh, uh, yeah, they are fighting in all kind of of disciplines. And just to tell you, the Norwegian team is Marit Björgen, Martin Jonsrud Sundby, Tari Eibø and Ingrid Tandrevold, the, the biathlete. And for Sweden, it's the good friends of Kicken. It's, it's Emil and Anna Jönsson. It's Theodor Pettersson and Frida Karlsson. So they are big stars. They are, so I think Jessica Diggins is more famous in Scandinavia than she is in the US because they know everything. I know when my daughter two years ago had a breakthrough in, in Tour de Ski where she was a top 10 finisher, uh, I couldn't believe how many people came and knew about it. So the impact that the gold medal for Kicken and, and Jessica made in Scandinavia is huge. I don't think you really can believe how huge it is. And this brings me to, to a comment to the organizing committees around because uh, there is one question that nobody really talk about because with the COVID and the situation, we have to organize most of the events. It's probably the same by you without any spectators. And that means the organizers get no income, but they get more expenses because they have to pay for all the tests and all these uh, COVID restrictions. So, you know, like when Ruppolding in Germany have 25,000 people every time, you can imagine how, many, how much money they lose. So this is gonna be a big, big problem for a lot of the organizers. Holmer column without spectators is a bankruptcy. 
Yeah. But uh, to answer your question, Peter, uh, the impact of the US ski team has been very, very big the, the last, yeah, since Kikin and Andy started their career. <laughs> yeah. Well, and Keaton, I wanted to go uh, to you. Uh, Shell and I were, of course, there at, uh, I believe, your first Olympics was Salt Lake. Um, that was a pretty uh, uh, big Olympics. No, Lillehammer, was, Lillehammer was my first. <laughs> Lillehammer was your first. Okay. <laughs> and Keaton, um, I always wondered, because you, you have been such a role model and shepherded a generation of, of skiers, did Becky Scott's performance in Salt Lake motivate you in a special way or show once again that it could be done? Absolutely. Um, I mean, the power of role models has always been such a, a powerful thing in my life. And so to be there competing at those games was incredible. It was a lifelong dream um, ever since I was five years old to, to compete for the Team USA. Um, but to see her get to the podium, you know, and at that point, that day, it was a bronze medal ultimately upgraded to gold, but the fact that a North American, and I had been racing with Sarah and Becky and Milan and the whole Canadian women's team on the NORAM circuit, so I, I felt like this kind of connection to them, you know, I just knew I was a few years behind, and so watching her have that result, then watching them four years later um, when Chandra won, and um, I mean, that was so powerful in making me feel like it was possible. And um, the theme of those 2002 Olympics was light the fire within. And I like vividly remember standing in the crowd watching the medal ceremony and feeling that fire grow up. Even though I had, I had gotten my butt kicked that day, um, I, I finished 61st in that first portion of that one day pursuit. So, you know, there was nothing to say it was possible, but I felt inspired. And, um, and then to the credit of our, you know, our coaching staff, uh, when I when I came in with the ambition of saying like, okay, I, I want to go for a medal. What's it going to take? Um, you know, getting the right guidance to figure out what those benchmarks were going to be. And it looked like it was going to take 10 years. And that was incredibly daunting at that point. But yet inspired by Becky and, and seeing a roadmap ahead, it's just like, all right, let's do this. Let's roll up our sleeves. And uh, it's amazing now to look back and see how that all unfolded. And now to see that, um, you know, with Jesse and I, our result at the Olympics and really the whole team contributing uh, so successfully at the top international level now, you know, you can tell these young skiers, they just, they're coming up with that belief. And that means we're just going to keep raising the bar higher. Thank you. Shell, you want to uh, chime in? Yeah, I just want to add something. Uh, how important cross country is, how big stars the North Americans are in, in Scandinavia. I have a friend here in the, in the small village where I live. He has two dogs. The names are Becky and Kikin. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. It's good, good to hear. Um, I want to uh, uh, ask, uh, go to John Estel uh, first on this. Uh, John, are, are you having a sense of uh, how courses, ski racing courses of the future may be looking. Um, do, you, do you know where we might be headed? I think the sort of the approach to homologation has stabilized somewhat in the last few years, but I'd be really interested in hearing what Keegan and Andy have to say about this because they have the opinion that counts. Um, but I think the over the last few years, the one change has been, I think, to try to design courses that uh, encourage classic skiing and natural classic skiing, um, where there isn't a need for technique zones uh, and where turns are real turns. And uh, so I think that's still sort of a, a refinement that courses are undergoing, but uh, and. Chris knows a lot about this as well, of course, but, you know, the figuring out what sort of uphill is too gradual and makes people want to double pole and isn't really natural for diagonal striding. Um, how long is too long of a gradual downhill that lets uh, skiers who don't have wax on catch back up to skiers who got ahead of them on the uphill. So I think those things, especially the gradients of uphills and downhills, uh, have changed, and I think that's something that's going to continue to be refined. Um, 
but I'd really be interested in what Keegan and Chris and Andy have to say about that because because they're the ones out there. Thanks, John. Let's go to you. What are your thoughts here? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a tough one to to tackle the whole double pole revolution and, and sprinting and how that's changed the sport. Um, personally, I'm somebody that doesn't really love regulations when it comes to technique. Um, and I think the kind of the striding zones and the pole length rules have actually worked out okay, but I think it would, we'd be better off without those types of regulations, just like John was mentioning, just with better course design and, and more thought out course design. It's funny, like everyone thought, okay, in order to make, make it so people don't double pole, let's make courses super steep with very steep hills and very steep downhills, but then people end up just herringboning, like you herringbone the hills. And so that's not necessarily a solution either. Um, as somebody who's raced plenty of World Cups, classic sprints where you then enter a technique zone, it's a little awkward. What do you do if your wax is slipping and you want a double pole? Like maybe your wax just isn't good that day. Uh, what if you want to kick double pole, but no, you have to stride. It really is pretty awkward, I think, for a racer. Um, and I get why FIS put those regulations in. It was mostly to prevent kind of, yeah, a mass transition to pure double polling on the domestic level. On the World Cup, it's really hard for athletes to cheat because uh, we have video cameras on us all, at all times. So we're not going to skate during the classic race. But that's not the case in very small domestic races around the world where there aren't cameras on course. And so I get the reason behind those regulations. But I agree. I think we can get there without um, just by better course design. Um, and in my opinion, I don't know. I've raced drama plenty of times. And and I, I bet Keegan feels the same way. I hear Shell Eric's voice right now, and it sends like shivers down my spine, like I'm right at the start line of Draman all of a sudden. Um, and I always thought that was a great race. It was like the one double pull sprint of a year. I mean, if people are going to double pull a sprint, to me, that's no different than somebody like using V2 technique through an entire skate race. It's simply the fastest mode of, of technique for that course. And so I'm okay with pure double point races, but that's just one man's opinion. Thank you. Uh, Chris Grover, why don't you chime in with some thoughts on this? Yeah, sure. I hope, I hope everyone can hear me okay. No, yeah, I think, the, uh, you know, the, I think the other, you know, the other big course change that we've seen over recent years is just the utilization of smaller courses, right? I mean, the court, you know, all of a sudden we've gone from, in the past several decades, from the long courses, some of the traditional 10, 15 courses, kilometer courses, where, we, where we're doing one big loop um, to courses where we're really spending, you know, maybe it's a 3.3K, a 2.5K, a 3.75K. We keep coming back to the stadium. It's made, it's made some hard courses, um, you know, frankly, using, using kind of uh, all the vertical that's often right next to a, a ski stadium has produced some quite challenging, quite challenging courses for the athletes. Um, it certainly makes it exciting for the spectators. It's a better use of, of, of cameras and the money that goes into cameras. It hopefully pro provides better television, but Shell Eric would be, would be the expert there and yourself, of course. Um, but that's, that's been a big change. And I agree with Andy, too, uh, the, you know, the changes we've had to make to preserve classic skiing, uh, to try to keep classic skiing. Um, they've been a little bit awkward at times. Um, but at the same time, we are still waxing for races, uh, kick waxing for races. And so that's, that's a win right now that, uh, you know, I think, you know, uh, as you all know, Vegard Olvang is the chair of the cross country committee for the FIS. And he was fairly concerned a few years ago that we might be losing, losing classic skiing. And it's the one place where we, where we stand out, um, uh, a bit against the other Nordic disciplines, biathlon, Nordic combined. Uh, we still have classic skiing. And so we felt like it is an important part of our heritage um, that, we, that we make sure we, pre we preserve the, some traditional elements of, of skiing in our sport. Thanks, Chris. Keegan, do you want to chime in on this subject? Yeah, I thought I would contribute from a little different level, given that I'm the only woman on this panel. Um, what I saw really uh, was, you know, as, as we got into the era of sprint racing, uh, there was a lot of experimentation on what is a sprint, how long should it be, how short should it be, you know, do we need to make it harder? And um, in particular with some championship courses, we've seen that, you know, we've 
they ended up making the women's course shorter because they felt that that was important to keep things exciting. But in a lot of cases, it required taking out the, the most exciting element on the course. Um, and so I think that can sometimes be a detriment um, because it makes, uh, it changes the dynamic of the women's race. It creates that idea of like, why are the men and women doing different courses? Um, you know, I think some venues have done it really well. Some venues uh, have not. So it's been really follow interesting to follow that discussion. Um, you know, I do think that the trajectory towards to shorter courses um, has been really beneficial for uh, um, raising the interest in the sport, um, making it more exciting for spectators um, as an athlete. You know, it was a bit of a shock initially, but um, I think I came to to really enjoy it, um, and the the form it makes it conducive to good head to head racing as well. Um, so that's exciting. Um, I you know in the midst of my career, we did a lot of city sprints. You're not seeing so many of those anymore. So I'd just be kind of curious to see what the what the discussion is on that going forward. Um, you know, the pros to those city sprints are of course the atmosphere and the, and the bringing the sport to the people. But in terms of course design, it was always very challenging to to make courses that were quality enough. Um, didn't damage the skis with that kind of thing. So um, I feel fortunate that I got to have that experience and I hope to see a few more of those in the schedule coming up because I think it was really innovative and um, you know someday I want to see a World Cup sprint in Central Park. Yeah it would be awesome. Shell I wanted to ask you a little bit we talked before we went on the air about uh, some of the latest news coming out uh, about florals. Uh, what can you tell us because there has been some news in the last week or so I think. Well, I can tell you this is the hottest topic in Europe at the moment uh, in cross-country skiing. Everybody's talking about this and uh, it seems like everybody has the same opinion. It's, uh, it's too early. Everybody wants it. Everybody wants to get rid of the floor, but uh, the test uh, methods are not ready. Uh, there has been a lot of interviews with the athletes, with Johaug, with Kalla, with uh, Per Mikoski, everybody. And they are now afraid that the sport will be unfair. That because I know that some of the eastern countries are buying up all the fluor <laughs> wax and trying to find methods to get around this. Uh, that are the rumors. But as long as as uh, this is not fully developed, they cannot put it on the market. Because I fully agree with Andy. We have too many rules today. We are scaring the young people to start with this sport. First of all, cross-country skiing is starting to be so expensive with all the equipment. They need double for the one for skating, one for classic and special pools for this and this and this. And then for, I don't know, they have, it, it's really an expensive sport now. And um, this floor is, is making, it, it's another element that makes uh, possibilities that it's unfair. And then you lose interest, you lose the viewers on television uh, and sport, the sport is falling down because cross country is actually not the hottest sport in Europe at the moment. Uh, German television, Germany is the big motor economy in economy for sport in Europe. They are not transmitting cross country skiing live anymore. Uh, yeah. So it, it's basically Scandinavia and Russia holding up the interest at the moment in Europe. And another problem is that this is the last season coming now where, uh, <laughs> where cross-country skiing will be on free TV in Norway and Sweden and Finland. It's going on pay TV probably. And I, it, when I lived in Finland, they did the same and the interest for skiing went like a stone. So I'm afraid this is a wrong way to go. Biathlon chose the other way because they had a lot of offers, but they stayed with the EBU, the European Broadcasting Union, where it's a lot of free channels. And um, there are a lot, are of, a lot of questions now. So I agree so with that. We should have more rules at the moment. Uh, I can tell you, Norwegian waxing team, they threw out waxes for more than four hundred thousand dollars from the truck because they wanted to get rid of everything they had a company to clean the whole truck and they don't know if they did the right thing so nobody knows what to do with this fluor thing and i think fis tomorrow gonna say uh, the, the fis council that we have to postpone it for one year okay well thank you shell ali i want to go to you and switch uh, gears here a little bit and our time is short uh, before we go to the Q&A. But Ali, I want to talk about snowmaking 
a little bit. You guys do it really, really well. It's been uh, very important uh, uh, for your business model up there. Uh, and we have had races that we might not have had anywhere uh, because of uh, what you guys have done. Can, can you uh, talk a little bit, uh, but not too long, uh, on snowmaking and, uh, and uh, what maybe is the future in that? Oh, man. Uh, I mean, I think it is the future. Um, we're, we're coming to the point now nationally where we, we really can't host a major national championship if a venue doesn't have snowmaking. And that's trickled down even to a regional level where we really look at whether a venue has snowmaking because the weather just doesn't really cooperate anymore. Um, I think, you know, it's been a, it's been a, a learning curve up here for sure. And we've, we figured out how to do it. We don't, um, we make all our snow in a pile and then we truck it out onto the trails, which requires a ton of infrastructure, um, you know, machines, the operators to use to, to do those or operate those machines and it's it's definitely a labor of love uh, there are other venues that can pipe it right onto course i think that's more of the, the traditional model um a more expensive undertaking but i i think that that's unfortunately the future where this the sport is going whether you're farming snow which they do for a lot of the city sprints um i think that's probably what it counts as for what they do in uh, fairbanks nowadays the snow falls in october and they just ski on it until april um barely get any during the season um but yeah i think if you are it, it, the hard part is the, the cost though and so that's the biggest issue in the united states is it is incredibly expensive to set up and uh, it's not a sport that makes a ton of money so those are your issues but you can't really live without it okay well thank you um i i want to start with sferi and uh let's just go down the line if you were to look in a crystal ball uh where do you think we might be in 10 years sferi <laughs> Well, it's interesting because the trend has definitely been to shorter loops, snowmaking, tougher courses, faster equipment, fitter athletes. Um, and every time we take a snapshot, we kind of go, oh, can't get any faster than this. And then it does. Um, I think that they might play around a couple more times with formats to make really exciting formats that um, are easy for anyone to watch and get excited about. That's the trend has definitely gone from heading out for 15 Ks and coming and cl collapsing on the finish line, one person every 30 seconds to much more sprints, mass starts, relays, stuff like that. And I think that in order for the sport to keep the audience, they have to keep moving to exciting formats. What they'll be, I'm not sure. Uh, maybe they'll, you know, that Youth Olympics last year, they're trying, uh, you know, kind of something with some jumps and some tur sharp turns and stuff like that, just to make it more exciting. I wouldn't be surprised if they kind of have one or two events like that in eight or 10 years. Thanks, Fair. Let's go to John Estel in Fairbanks. John, look into the crystal ball. What do you think? Well, Sperry stole most of the things that I was going to say. So <laughs> um, I think uh, the formats, uh, I think, will continue to evolve. Um, and I'm hoping, like in biathlon, they do a mixed relay. I think probably some mixed gender events in cross country may happen, a, a mixed gender team sprint or mixed gender relay. Um, maybe go a little shorter with the relays. I know in the World Cup schedule now, the men's relay is only seven and a half, but at the championships, they go 10. If the men's relay distance was five or seven and a half, especially on a two and a half K loop, you've got a lot more action. Uh, the teams are closer together, easier to catch up and pass, that sort of thing. Um, so I, th I think those are possibilities. Uh, I know a few years ago, I think it was in Poland, they did a race that was kind of up one side of a mountain and down the other. I don't know if Keegan and Andy did that and what they thought of it, but maybe uh, hill climbs as they do at the end of the tour to ski or descending races. Probably Andy would like the descending races. Um, <laughs> but uh, I, I think those are the those are the things in the future maybe. But as uh, Shell Eric said, and as Ollie said, I, the Things that really concern me are the cost of the sport. It's no longer a people's sport. It's an expensive sport. And the mm -hmm. snowmaking, um, the absence of snow in, in key places. And 
luckily Fairbanks hasn't become one of those places yet. We still have pretty good snow here, but there are so many places that the snow really comes and goes. Anchorage has had some really bad winters the last few years. So those are the issues I think we've really got to come to terms with. All right, John, I'll go to, uh, we'll go to Shell Eric. Well, um, I will surprise you now, Peter. Because okay. I, I want to go back. Mm -hmm. I want to go back because this is why Norwegians and Swedes and Finns got interested in skiing. We all knew what this sport was about. You remember, you are as old as me. We had the 15, <laughs> you are even older than me, you old man. I am. <laughs> <laughs> we had the 15, the 30, the, uh, and the 50, and the relay. Keep those ones, put the sprint, and uh, like John said, a mixed relay and a long distance mustache. Have the same races every time. People will recognize the program from every year in the championships, in, the, in every big race. Because today I have even myself been announced, I have announced 1000 plus World Cup races. I have announced tours where I didn't even know the rules myself. I had to go and ask the TD what, 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 where they got the points. You know that yourself. So yes. we have to make a program where people recognize from time to time and they feel familiar with this. But like Sveta said, it's when they go out 15 kilometers and come back. And like, uh, like Grover said, the, the shorter loops, you don't have to have that, but you have to have a better production. You have to show it better. We have a, a clip on Norwegian television from 1966 when they are waiting for Jermen Egen at Gratis Heaven, you know, in Holmekollen. We're waiting for four minutes, 33 seconds in one shot. You can't have that today, but you have to produce it so you find the drama in the race. I remember 50K in Holmekollen when Pille Kotter was leading. I don't know if he still is in the, in the finish. That's 10 years ago. But you have to find those spots and that is television who has to do that. Uh, sprint is good. I'm not so sure about team sprint. Sorry, kicking, but team sprint. Uh, when it comes to drama, the drama in team sprint is more uh, out of the program. Is if somebody break a pool or fall or something. So I would rather have two individual sprint, one free and one classic. Thank you for your thoughts, Keegan. What are you thinking about? Uh, you know, I think we uh, with technology uh, getting so much more advanced every every month every year um that's a, a potential opportunity for the sport to to bring the data into the people i participated in a zwift ride last weekend with ten thousand people and uh you know cross-country skiing is not a sport that you can put on a treadmill or a smart trainer but perhaps bringing the fans uh, and the people in closer to the data of what's going on because cross-country skiing is just such a phenomenal physiological physiological uh, sport and so to bring people in on on what what is max heart rate and what is lactate going and the speeds they're traveling and overlays you know really working with the tv to to keep it exciting um uh and and have it in a digital form is is going to be really important for i think engaging kids you know getting kids to follow you know their heroes um in scandinavia you know you just you grew up with seeing it on the tv so of course you knew who all the heroes were you know even though we're starting to have world cup winners in the united states we still have a big gap between what our young kids know and, and who our skiers are. So I'm hoping that technology can help bridge that. Um, you know, I think the silver lining to COVID is we potentially will get a huge increase in participation, like Ollie said. So if we can capture that, then that could translate into um, an awesome, awesome uh, growth in the sport over the next few years. So uh, I think um, the, the ski cross event definitely holds a lot of promise. It, it got great ratings at the um, Youth Olympic Games. And so um, that could be a fun potential new event. Um, but then if one, if one gets added, one has to go usually. So it's, it's a tough balance. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Keek. And Andy, over to you for your uh, crystal ball prognostications. Well, um, I don't disagree with Shell Eric either when it comes to maybe having a little more continuity with our events. Um, to me, yeah, the 30, the 50, and the 15 in sprints are kind of the bread and butter. Um, I think the skiathlon, as much as we love it because we're like Nordic fans, it's slightly confusing on TV and doesn't and isn't always the most spectator-friendly sport or 
or whatever, not the most exciting to watch on TV, scathlon. So I wouldn't mind. I know people are going to give you some slack for this, but let's get rid of the scathlon and add another uh, another sprint of a different technique uh, more often on the world championship and Olympic stage, I think would be the my recommendation. Um, and then I think when it comes to the floor band is obviously a good step forward when it comes to sustainability with FIS, um, but I think FIS is going to have to really check in again on their calendar and maybe work more closely with the national governing bodies to create a slightly more cohesive schedule that doesn't involve beep bopping around the globe so much. Talking about climate change and sustainability, that's something I would really like to see FIS step up on. Um, if you look back, even in 1980, I think it's like 1983, there was like 12 World Cups on a schedule within a year. Now we're at 35 uh, wow. with the tour, all the tours and stuff like that. And so I wouldn't mind seeing potentially less World Cups on a schedule. Let's knock that down to maybe 20 World Cups in a year. Hit all the major good venues, the Holman Cones, the Lotties. Um, but then maybe space it out a little bit more so that you, own, you hit Scandinavia once and then you have a two-week travel break to Middle Europe. And so you're not – the carbon footprint of all the traveling would go down substantially instead of kind of traveling around so much. And so you have one block in Central Europe, maybe one block in Asia and Russia, and then that's the World Cup season, uh, 20 races versus having so many. Good, Andy. Thank you. And Chris Grover, your thoughts for the future? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I've had a little bit of a hard time following the conversation just due to my, my poor connection. But first of all, I mean, like, I, I think Andy brings up a really good point. And I, I'd like to take a moment to commend both Andy and Keegan on their leadership when it comes to climate change and how it affects sport. Um, you know, Andy in particular, but both of them have been very involved in Protect Our Winters, um, which advocates um, for saving snow sport around the world and works in a kind of a bipartisan way um, to advocate um, for policies in Washington that actually can, can help us preserve our snow. So that's been, that's been absolutely huge. But I agree with, with Andy and, and Keegan completely that, you know, we, we have to take a strong stand um, on climate change and the impacts on sport. And as a community, as the FISC community, we haven't always been there. So we need to, we need to step up and we're starting to move that way, but we've been slow, slow to move that way. And I can say the same from, from the US ski and snowboard perspective. We've been a little bit slow to move that way, but now we're moving there um, in full force. And um, it's, it's really critical. On the topic of on the topic of, of formats, you know, Andy brings up a good point about skiathlon. It's uh, it's something we've been talking about for a little bit now. I think I think one of the challenges is whenever you have a discipline that um, kids can't walk right out the door and do. Um, that's that's hard. Um, it, we can't ask families to buy um, a kind of boots uh, for a specific event that aren't even sold to the general public. Um, so as fun as it is to watch sometimes some of the events, um, I agree with the points that, that many people have made here that they need to be accessible to the public. Um, but, uh, whether it's a master skier or a young child, you need to be able to walk out the door and uh, try to emulate, emulate the stars. All right, thank you. And uh, we'll go to Ollie, one of my skiers at Harvard. Uh, Ollie, uh, you're certainly a big part of the present and you will be a big part of the future. What are your uh, thoughts as we wrap up this interview and then we'll go to uh, the Q&A? Ali? Yeah, um, uh, some awesome thoughts on, on the World Cup from some people who are far more qualified to talk about it than I, although I like uh, everything I was sort of hearing. Um, I, looking domestically, I'm really nervous about where the future will take us if the sport continues to grow in its reliance on equipment and just get as expensive as it is. Like John mentioned, it used to be the people's sport and now, you know, it's a rich person's sport. And so not to, to blaspheme what Shell, Eric, and Andy have been saying, because I agree we have, uh, we're bordering on too many rules between the fences. I think that we need to start seriously looking at some rules about the number of skis that athletes can participate with um, whether it's at varying levels or even taking that all the way up to the World Cup level because everything trickles down from there within the racing community. But 
if we continue to let this turn into an arms race, we're going to lose major, major, um, you know, athlete pools that we just won't have access to anymore because of the money. And in the U S at least, if you look at this sport, it exists in two worlds. You've got, you know, Alaska and, and, um, you know, two major metropolitan areas where you can actually ski same thing in the twin cities. There are huge populations there that we can't even touch because of how expensive the sport is. And then where, you know, the, those of us from Vermont on the call here know that a lot, there's a lot of rural Vermont that's going to get priced out of this sport. And I'm sure that it's the same in a whole lot of other places. You know, I know that Chris lives in a, outside of a resort community, but every time you go down Valley from those resorts, there are whole, you know, different worlds of populations that can't do the same things that the people who frequent the resort can. Um, so we need to figure out how to make our sport cheaper and more accessible if we're going to have an athlete base to ski on whatever limited snow is there in the 20 World Cups that Andy has proposed. Thank you very much, Ali, uh, and uh, thanks for your eloquence on that. Uh, it's been great to get so many perspectives here, and we're going to turn. We have uh, a number of questions. Huh. Jim Galanis, when is the next sauna? Uh, Jim, whenever you're in town. Uh, uh, Peter Oliver, uh, who's been a longtime journalist, why can't both freestyle and classic sprints, uh, whoops, uh, and classic sprints be included in every Olympics? Alternating between the two means an athlete may have to wait eight years to get a chance to compete in their event. Uh, Keegan, you want to go for that? Yeah, uh, boy, I don't know if I want to like vote for this or not because it'll just be no, like, you don't oh, I retired too early. But, um, you know, it's a point that I certainly feel passionate about being kind of more oriented towards skate versus classic. So I felt like I was one of those athletes in the position where I got my chance once every eight years. Um, but it, when you look at it, it's, it's a really tough balance because you got to have the short distance and the long distance, you got to have the classic and the skate. and it's been hard, you know, we already have six medal events per gender at the Olympics, and that's more than any of the other winter sports. So to, add, to think about adding another one on top of that is kind of unrealistic. So if we can't add, then we have to take something away. And, um, you know, I mean, now that the skiathlon is kind of being looked at more critically, that could be a potential there. Um, but uh, it's, it's definitely, it's been like a discussion for the whole time that I've been involved with, like at this level as an athlete representative and, you know, I think the, the numbers do speak well for the sprint as a spectator sport, and that may be the case we need, but um, it's, it's a tough balance. Because then someone will say, well, I'm a really good 10K classic skier, and I only get a chance every eight years. Um, so, yeah. Thanks, Keegan. Does anybody else want to jump in quickly on that? No. Okay. Uh, here's a, a, another one, and we thank everybody for the questions. Is any part of the decrease in course size due to climate change and snow availability? What are some areas doing to work with less or lack of snow with a concern that it may be lessened by quite a bit in the coming year due to climate change? Anybody want to pick up for sure. Say again, Ali, I'm sorry. I, that's the case in Craftsbury. We've hosted three Super Tour finals, and we've done them on 1K loops, 3K loops, and 5K loops, depending on the year. So, I mean, we shorten courses because of snow conditions all the time. We're, I mean, it's, I'd be interested to hear what Shell Eric has to say on that from a World Cup perspective because they, they'll bend heaven and earth to make a course happen, but I wonder if that's part of the, the thought process. Shell, you want to jump in? Oh, it's a little bit the same here, of course, uh, but when you come to World Cup level, there are rules. It can't be one kilometer. Uh, but you saw this marathon race, this uh, Yizerska in the Czech Republic uh, last year or two years ago. They had, <laughs> they had uh, several hundred starting and the, the loop was so short that I think only 16 <laughs> were not lapped and finished the race. So there are also practical reasons. I'm doing the first race, Peter, in two weeks uh, in wow. Iber, in Sweden, and they are planning to do a 10K on, on a one kilometer loop. So it's like Oli says, you have to <laughs> adjust to the conditions. That's, that's how you have to do it. In the World Cup, you cannot go to one kilometer. That is for, for the distance races, for the sprint is different. Yeah. All right, we've got a question here from uh, somebody who knows a lot about the sport, Ian Harvey out in Utah, a distinguished U.S. biathlete. 
Uh, what does the panel think about making courses more technical to encourage a higher skill level and de-emphasize the advantages gained by doping? Question mark. We saw some of this in the last tour to ski, and it was quite interesting. Anybody, Andy, you want to chime in? Yeah, I can chime in. Um, I think people would be surprised how polarizing this issue is on the World Cup. And Keegan will remember back to what year was it in Falun where they did the epic downhill? Uh, that was 2014. So in 2014, uh, the organizers in Falun changed the course uh, during a, we were going to do a prologue Murderbachen loop where you went straight up the Murderbachen and then like basically a slalom bobsled run down. And a lot of the athletes said, no way, this is, I don't know if they, I, I think there's a, a handful that are scared for their safety, but then there's another group that are kind of concerned that it makes the race unfair where you could fall and, you know, go into some netting and, and you'd be out of the out of the mini tour or the race or whatever it is. So, um, yeah, I think people would be surprised. I think there's people on the World Cup like like me when I was in the World Cup that would love to see more technical downhills, uh, more jumps, for example, on courses. I know that was something that Bill Koch was really passionate about was making sure, like, the downhills were really skiable and fun. He was, like, skating, I guess, during a lot of that. But it was, like, a big portion of the race was to make sure we have challenging downhills. And I think it's a double-edged sword as we make courses that are super challenging with really steep hills. Typically, when you have a really steep hill, you have a really quick, fast downhill, um, and it's they typically aren't super technical when you look at courses like Ruka, but I would love to see more technical downhills, but I'm not I sure all the Walker athletes would. And uh, we still have quite a few questions, so if we can keep our answers a, a little bit on the short side. Um, uh, well, somebody writes here, I'm interested in hearing more uh, on Keegan and Andy's opinions on sprint, uh, sprint length. Longer versus shorter. Keegan, why don't you start? Yeah, certainly, again, a discussion we had uh, on the World Cup committee within the athletes, and we, we all kind of came to a uh, consensus that around three minutes, plus or minus 30 seconds, is really seems to be the most ideal. It means you can get in enough terrain in the course. It still keeps it fast and exciting, but it doesn't, like, draw it out to where it starts to turn into a short distance race. Um, that said, sometimes, you know, organizers working with the terrain they have can be a little challenging and, and you can have a course that it falls in that range and then it decides to snow a bunch and it turns out to be four and a half minutes. Uh, so it's, it's a little bit challenging. I think the fun part of sprint racing is it is a little bit unpredictable. You know, you're going to have courses kind of all over the map, but I think we all kind of agree somewhere in that three minute range um, seems to work really well. And often, you know, times you can find a course that'll be it keep both men and women on the same course in that range, which is pretty cool. Andy, you want to chime in or do you agree? Okay, very good. We'll go on here. Uh, we've had a couple. Uh, one person writes, thanks, Andy, for your thoughts on climate change. Uh, my old friend Mark Latinen out of Minneapolis, uh, and uh, maybe you can go to John Estel on this. Uh, the influence of climate change at worldwide venues, is that affecting the sport? Uh, yes, I, I mean, obviously it is, and Shell Eric is probably the most, and Chris and Keek and Andy are the most familiar with this because they've, they've seen it firsthand. Uh, and, but, you know, it's a bigger problem now, but it was even a problem 20, 25 years ago as people who were on the World Cup circuit at that time know that there are, from time to time, you'd show up at a place for a big race and there might not be snow or it would be a brown strip around the, the, uh, the course. But it's just become much more acute and more widespread. And, and I think that the issue of snowmaking is how it's going to be dealt with. All right. Um, Sperry, I want, to direct this, oh, uh, I want to direct this towards you, if you don't mind. Rob Center, a uh, friend of mine uh, and very active in the uh, ski museum, Ask uh, comment on the future value of grassroots promotion. Um, where to go? Instructional opportunities with schools, local clubs, parks, and rec. Uh, how do we continue to get out there uh, the message of uh, a lifetime recreational opportunity, Sferi? Oh boy, um, I think when 
more clubs building up. Most clubs are trying to do that kind of cradle to grave where the older people will help the younger people. I know that's what, how we model our club. It's you're always, as you raise up the ladder and you get better and better, you can have more and more people following you and you're the mentor for them and things like that. And I think we just have to keep promoting things like that. And like Bill Coakley is a great way to start. And then we just need to keep encouraging everyone because it is a great sport for life and encouraging them to give back as they get older. Um, and I see pockets that are doing it really well. And I think that people can look around and kind of look for models that, that seem to be working and trying to emulate them. Thank you. Um, I'll go on to a, a question from, uh, or a comment from uh, our friend Jim Galanis, a uh, number uh, time Olympian and a US ski team member for a long time and really directed maybe towards you, Shell. I agree with Shell on continuity of events. Why don't we strive to present the traditional races in a better way and add to the sprints? When we add these events like ski cross, we continue to lose connection of the sport to the community and increase the cost of event production. Shell, what say you? I say thank you, Jim. <laughs> uh, it's about what I said, and uh, uh, like Kicken said, with the uh, with the jumps and with uh, with the ski cross, there is a sport called ski cross. There is a sport called downhill that Andy's is going to start with soon. So I mean, <laughs> and that 2014 in Falun, there were actually people taken to the hospital because it was dangerous. They fell down to some stones there. So. Uh, I, I totally agree with Jim. As a, for me, it's important that we keep the tradition. That's why I got interested. That's why so many Scandinavians got interested in this sport. If you take that away, we disappear. Maybe somebody else takes over. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Uh, for Andy and a follow-up with Keegan, uh, if she would like, uh, how can others join you in what sounds like your pursuit of combating climate change? Is there a formal representation by a Nordic group, Andy? Uh, well, Keegan and I both volunteer with Protect Our Winners, and you can check them out at protectourwinners.com. They have a, what's called an athlete alliance, which is made up of snowboarders, free riders, cross country skiers, mountain runners. So they're a great resource because they are a bipartisan lobbying organization that is really involved in like the political side of, of climate change and, and actually do trips to DC in lobby, totally nonpartisan, but are really involved in a lot of the votes that are happening on the legislative level. So yeah, protectourwinners.com. Anything to add, Keegan? Get out and vote. <laughs> you know, we all, all right. know that, uh, you know, getting out and voting and getting the right people in place to make the right policies is, is going to be crucial to uh, combating climate change and we need everybody to get out. Um, so Protect Our Winners has, has created some really amazing assets to help people understand the issues in their area, the candidates, um, how, to, how to register to vote. Um, so definitely go to protectourwinners.org and, and help. You can definitely, we can all help out that way. Uh, thank you. Uh, 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 Shell. I, I've talked a lot with uh, Ulvang about this climate changes also. So I know this is high up on the list in FIS. They are, they are really concerned about the climate changes. So this is on the agenda all the time. But all right, thank I you. I don't know what they are doing with it, but I know they are concerned about it. Even Sarah. How about a quick, uh, quick follow-up with Chris Grover? Chris, uh, can you uh, bring us up to date on what the FIS is thinking about regarding this or its posture? First of all, I gotta I gotta let Kika know that I voted today. I don't know if you can see that, but that's my vote. That's my I voted sticker. So I'm with you. I'm with you, Kiko. Um, I really I don't think I really am kind of qualified to comment on that. I don't know what's happening at the highest levels. Uh, I I work a little bit lower down in the in the organization, um, so I'm sorry I don't really know. All right, that's fine. Uh, from our friend Sam Von Trapp at Trapp Family Lodge. It's a pleasure to hear about the race scene from such an amazing panel. Any thoughts on recreational Nordic skiing? Ali, you want to talk about that? You've got a, a robust recreational program. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, well, well, thank you for the question, thank Sam. You for the question, Sam. Uh, 
I think the, I uh, think the uh, my impression my from, impression from, from grass, I'm sorry, there's like a gnarly echo. I hope everyone doesn't hear that. Fixed. Um, it just got fixed. Okay, good. I think the key is going to be um, to having a really good recreational product is to, to try to cater to the traditional side of the sport, you know, winding maybe in a lot of cases on groomed paths through the woods that people can go out and have an all day kind of slower, longer time on. And then also recognizing that a lot of what makes our sport super fun is, is really quality grooming on really quality trails. Uh, so if you can offer both of those experiences, you're going to really broaden your net. And I think what we're going to see in post COVID times is an increase in both, but especially in the like, sport enthusiast non-racer side of things i think um you know you're going to see crossover from a lot of, of athletes who normally cross train indoors in the winter time and might want to get outside so uh that's really really exciting because that could potentially um i mean that's a pretty actively uh, um economically active uh user group in a lot of cases and that's always really good for a sport like ours in the united states where um it's not the wealthiest sport all the time so that would be, those are my thoughts on recreational th skiing. I think it, it's going to be in a better place than it's been, um, provided that we offer the right product. All right. Uh, thank you. Our friend Joyce out in Frisco, Colorado. How does the group think about broadening the opportunities for more youth? It seems that this is a white sport and continues to be so. What are some ways to offer access in this great uh, sport we call XC skiing, AVSC, which, uh, uh, I, I believe as Aspen Valley Ski Club has been leading on this. Um, I, who would like to, anybody like to address this issue? I'll step in. Um, okay, so you can, thank you. Yeah, uh, this perfect timing, because um, it was going to build on all, all these comments. Um, you know, there is a, a group, a nonprofit group called the Share Winter Foundation uh, that was spearheaded uh, initially by a bunch of U.S. ski team trustees um, to get more uh, minority communities on snow, um, those who wouldn't normally have access. So through that foundation, they actually built a nonprofit ski resort in New Jersey. Initially, the focus was around Alpine. They built a whole ski area in New Jersey specifically to bring inner city kids out there, and they run through a six-week program to get them on snow. A second phase of that project was to add a, a snowmaking loop for Nordic, and uh, I haven't heard an update lately on that program, but... Um, that those kind of things are so important and another subset of the share winter foundation is this program called nordic rocks which is happening all over the country um they've done a lot in the twin cities in minneapolis they actually had a custom ski built that you can put on with just your snow boots or your shoes and they they travel around to schools and they get kids out um, on snow so they can run around and, and get that feeling of gliding on the snow so i think more programs like that to just really get get the literally get the skis on people's feet and um give them a chance to experiencing that and then hopefully creating some scholarship programs or ways to then bring kids into maybe the club system or um you know the trailhead in minneapolis is also doing a great job they have a lot of rental equipment available for then kids who get interested to then take it to the next step so um creating you know removing barriers um, for people to try the sport and then be able to actually progress into it i think is is really important and then we all just have to do our part to go out and encourage people you know share your passion and enthusiasm bring someone out on the snow for a day that's never been out and you you never know what kind of ripple effect that might have thanks keegan uh, my friend mark ernst in green bay this is a big question um uh can you address drope doping how prevalent or what are the remedies so shell you want to start that uh it's hard I, to... I know we don't have enough time to uh, do it justice but uh uh i'm i i can't say peter i'm just i i uh, <laughs> i follow no, i understand uh, i i follow what uh, vada and the other subject is what they find out and uh, of course there are always a lot of rumors around but you can't you can't really go on the rumors so i i, I don't really know to be very honest that's fine anybody else want to say anything about that yeah, this is this is Chris. I would I'd talk about that. Uh, you know, I think first of all, first of all, um, we're in a place now that is so much better than we were two decades ago, and uh, people like Jim Galanis that are on this call know this very well. As do as do all of you. Is that we had generations 
of USA athletes who never had a chance to demonstrate what their potential was and what their really true ability was. And that's because there was, there was a lot of doping in the sport. Um, and in the, in the last few decades, we've gone in the right direction. We've increased the testing. We've got whereabouts programs. We've developed blood passports. Um, the sport is so much cleaner than it used to be. And you see that in the fact that you have USA athletes like Andy and Keegan that have had unprecedented success and many more now too. USA athletes have always been clean, but we couldn't compete for a long time. And now we can, and now we can compete. And I, I would say the same of, you know, our, many of our Norwegian friends and Swedish friends and, and many others that are having success every weekend competing clean. And I think the exciting thing for us is, as USA athletes, is that uh, an USA team is that we know that um, we can win. We can do it the right way. We can, we can participate without cheating. Um, we can, um, and we can go to the highest level. We can, uh, uh, Keegan's got an Olympic gold medal and she did it the right way her whole career. And, um, and that's pretty reassuring. Yes, there are some, there are some places that, in the sport that still need to be cleaned up and we need to, we need to empower WADA, empower, empower the FIS, empower the IOC to continue to chase, chase these places down, these people down, uh, to make sure we have a level playing field. Um, but it's very reassuring to know that, um, that on the right day, USA can win. Uh, that's exciting. Thank you. Uh, how about this one? This is thought provoking. Now that the 50K is taking barely two hours, is it time to lengthen the long race? That sounds like a question I should ask John Estill about, an exceptionally clear thinker. Uh, okay. Um, well, actually, that was one of the uh, that was one of the questions I was going to mention in the uh, in the thoughts for the future, and um, I guess. Uh, I'd be interested to see what Andy and uh, Keegan and Shell have to say, because back when Severi and I were racing, and Todd Grover and Holly were just little kids, um, you know, a three-hour 50K was, it wasn't standard. The fastest people were faster than that. But a three-hour race is so much different from a two-hour race. And now, um, you know, winning time in Lochte and the winning time in Seyfeld were both, you know, the guys were skiing, uh, 10 minute 5Ks for, for less than two hours. So the speed, it seems like if you wanna have events that are different physiologically, um, if every event is basically conducted at the same speed, it doesn't seem to me that there's a big physiological difference. But I don't know from a television standpoint and an interest standpoint, if a three hour race is gonna hold people's attention, but I think it would be very different for the athletes. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, we still got some great questions. Penny uh, McEdward Rand is writing in. Uh, do you think there would ever be a race where wax of the day is what all racers have to use? Uh, and she also, so I want to get, that's the question. Uh, I'd like, I, I like to hear that Nordic Cross could possibly be considered as a new format or at least woven into parts of the course. Let's test the all-around best skier for endurance, quickness, strength, and agility. Uh, thanks, uh, and, uh, Penny is uh, the coordinator of Nordic X at the Cochrane Ski Resort in uh, Richmond. Uh, well, what do you think, gang? Or Sferi, what do you think about the wax of the day? Why not? Well, they actually do that in, I think, for some biathlon races nationally. And we're kind of moving that way a little bit regionally in the East for like Q16 championships and Eastern high school championships and trying to make agreements on, okay, let's stick without, it's like the floral ban. You know, once you start and say, okay, we're gonna cut that out. There, are, it's funny. I would love to see that personally, but, um, 
there are a lot of people fight against it because they say, oh, you know, waxing so much part of it. And um, I don't know, it's a tricky one. I'd like to see it played with. And I think a couple places are experimenting with it and probably the jury's out on that. And then as far as that, the course thing, Andy mentioned that, that um, he'd like to see that. I know a lot of people would like to see more, more fun, challenging, more transitions, stuff like that in, in race courses. Um, I think on the classic races, it's so hard to have too many changes and corners and undulating stuff that are really fun to ski because the tracks get wiped out and then it gets iffy on are you skating or whatever, but it's something definitely worth playing around with. And All trying. right, uh, thanks Barry. Uh, Ali, a nice uh, comment to you from Mike McCarthy. Wanted to thank Ali and the entire uh, COC crew for maintaining such a great and sustainable environment for both high level racing as well as nurturing youth and family skiing. Thanks for your contributions to the sport. Oh, we're gonna don't, don't thank me, Mike. Buy a Concept Two ergometer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our friend Peggy Shin, who uh, of course uh, wrote a very definitive book on the women's program uh, after uh, uh, Keegan and Jesse's success, but it chronicles uh, the U.S. ski team uh, from the advent of the women's program. Chris uh, Grover will set you up for this one. Back to our old foe, COVID. How is COVID affecting the U.S. Ski Team's World Cup budget this year? Do you need to rent more vans, more lodging, more wax space? What's the answer, Chris? Yeah, good. Really good question. All of, all of the above. Um, I think um, <clears throat> in, in the, on the first, on, the, on one hand, we've had some savings because we have not run a single training camp. Uh, this year and and so that's been that's been obviously pretty tough um, but as very alluded to earlier um, the fact that we had really kind of um, intentionally pushed towards a club system um, quite a few years ago is really helping us now that we have great we, we feel quite confident that we have very good preparation of the athletes that's happening in their different in their different clubs this summer um, so we have some savings that we can take forward into the winter. So that's, so that's good because we're going to need those savings. We're going to need those savings because we not only are going to need more rooms on the World Cup, but we are also going to be keeping people in Europe longer, longer periods of time. And that includes athletes and staff. Um, but also in the cross-country world, in the FIS world, the costs of testing um, are falling on our shoulders. Those fall on, they, those are not falling, well, I should say costs of testing uh, within volunteers and a host organization will fall on the host organization. But in terms of teams, the cost of testing athletes and staff with the team fall on us. And some of those tests, as you know, are quite expensive. Um, you know, I know, I think we start off the World Cup in Ruka in Finland, and I think a COVID test there may cost as much as 195 euros uh, per person, per test. And we're getting tested frequently, and that falls back on the teams. So it's gonna be a real struggle for us this year um, uh, to, to find a way to kind of get through as much of the season we can with the budget that we have. All right, thank you. Uh, comment from, uh, or she uh, Shell, did you wanna say something? Yeah, the rules are now that the test cannot be older than 72 hours. Uh, then you have to take a new test. It's the same for cross-country and biathlon. And also for all the organizers. So the first event I will be doing in Betelstöld and in Norway, they are Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It means they have to test all the organizers on Thursday. But then it won't last till Sunday. So they have to test again on s Saturday night. So they got double cost for this. All right, thank you. Reese Brown, uh, who heads up uh, cross-country ski areas of America, uh, just a comment really to Sam's question. The industry is predicting a significant increase in participation this year based on what we've seen in cycling and currently seeing a large increase in entry-level packages being sold in August and September. I would guess that's true. Andy, I see you shaking your head in agreement. That's good to hear. Uh, 
about it's that. Good, uh, it's one of the silver linings of COVID. You know, people want to spend more time outside, and I think we're all grateful for that in some ways, you know? Yeah, uh, absolutely. All right. Uh, several people are commenting, uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, and um, um, let's see. I have... Uh, Andy and Keegan, thanks for all you've done for the sport, being such a, an inspiration. Um, this is a, a big question here. Could the panelists comment on equality, diversity? Uh, uh, anybody want to speak to that at all? Uh, I want to give a plug, Pete, on that, on that topic to um, what's going on with the Lopit Foundation. Keegan mentioned the trailhead and, you know, that Theodore Worth Park where we were all Super bummed to not have a World Cup last year. But one of the coolest things that that Lafayette Foundation is doing, uh, and Piet Bednarski talked to a bunch of us about it last fall when we were at a TD seminar, is they actually have a 1,500-meter um, medalist from World Championships and on the track. I believe it's a Moroccan guy who lives in the Twin Cities now. He's on their staff, and he's doing um, outreach to a lot of the immigrant diaspora communities in the Twin Cities. And they're using running to get those kids into the three sports that they do. So it's running, mountain biking, and cross-country skiing. And Piat was saying he's hoping that it's sort of this Trojan horse to get a lot of these kids into skiing. And um, it's just one of those examples where, where representation is such a huge part of it. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, you know, Keegan can speak to a ton of this with Fast and FEMA. What you've done with that has been incredible. I've, I've witnessed it. And uh, maybe you could talk about how that's, that you can, if you have ideas on switching that towards more of a, you know, racial equality and that sort of stuff with, with your, your approach to getting kids in. All right, Keegan, you want to chime in on that? And that will be, uh, then we'll wrap it up. Sure, quickly. Well, I'll just, I'll just tie in your two points. I mean, one of the most powerful things we found with Fast and Female is how well girls relate to their role models. And I've seen it at Andy's speed camps as well. I mean, when the kids get to interact with these people who they've seen on a poster, they've seen on TV, and they get to find out that they're real human beings that grew up just like they did, um, it somehow gets them excited and, and, and lowers, their, lowers their guard, increases their confidence. And so when it comes to uh, diversity, equality, and inclusion, you know, we just, we have to do a better job of getting some, some more role models out there so that um, kids can see themselves in someone who's already doing the sport. Um, so, you know, I think that we can really partner with the, the industry on this one of, you know, doing some good promotional activities um, to encourage people to come out and ski, you know, making sure we're getting, um, you know, good diversity in terms of our, um, the people we're featuring, you know, of course, we want it to be legitimate, not just for show, but um, championing the stories. Um, I've been working with L.L. Bean a lot this summer, and um, they've totally shifted their ambassador program to, to really celebrate not just the, you know, the celebrities or the athletes, but really finding people that are out just sharing their love for the outdoors and getting more people into that community. So, um, you know, Fast and Female has been such a fun project. I've been so impressed with all my fellow uh, skiers who have just, you know, happily shared their time um, to come and be with the girls. And um, it's also been great to see what the guys have done. So we just have to keep doing more of that, you know, when, when we can get back to having races and having camps again, those are perfect times to, to bring the young population in to meet their heroes. Thanks, Keegan, and we will. Um, this has been awesome. Um, other than uh, Shell Eric is ready for breakfast now in Norway. Uh, but uh, I want to thank you all. Asperi Caldwell, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. It's great to see you all. Yeah, and uh, our longtime friend John Estel. John, uh, have a great winter up in Fairbanks, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. It was really fun. Good. Shell Eric Christensen, uh, my great friend, uh, thank you so much for bringing us an international perspective and for all the enthusiasm you, uh, you have created over the years to making the sport fun. Thank you, Shell. Thanks the same, Peter. And thank you, Kicken. It's nice to see you back and healthy again. I haven't seen you for a while. <laughs> oh, and look at all this hair. I don't know what to do yeah. with it so much. It looks great. It, there is some pink in it still, I guess, right? Yeah, I got, to, got a chance to add that back in this summer. So it uh, feels good. good. feels good to be back. Good. Olympic gold medalist, Keegan Randall, thank you for your time and joining us. Really a delight to have you. My pleasure. This is so cool to see uh, so many people uh, from the cross-country family here together to talk about the sport we love. And thanks to everyone for joining us tonight. Thank you. 
Andy Newell, my fellow Bennington, Vermont native, thanks so much. Uh, wishing you all the best in Bozeman and wherever your travels take you. Yeah, thanks, Peter. It's an honor to share the screen with all you folks. It's nice seeing everyone. Thank you. Ollie Burris from Craftsbury, thanks very much. I look forward to seeing you this winter and maybe announcing some of your races if we have any. <laughs> Thanks, Pete. It's, uh, it was a pleasure and a privilege. Thank you so much. And Chris Grover, uh, thank you, Chris, for joining us from your home. You have done, and your staff, an amazing job in the last 10 years and uh, uh, given us many reasons to cheer and to cry and uh, just to follow what your team has done. So thank you, Chris. Uh Thank you. Thank you, Peter. It's so fun to be on a call with all of you guys. It's, uh, this group uh, includes a lot of my mentors and, and uh, two of the most talented athletes that I've ever had a chance to work with, um, and certainly two, two athletes who put USA cross-country skiing on the map, uh, at least in the last decades. Um, so it's an absolute pleasure to be with you all. So thank you. All right, thank you very much. We appreciate all you've done, ladies and gentlemen, who have joined us here on this webinar. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, it has just been an honor to be with these people and to share our love and passion and the collective knowledge of our sport with all of you. So uh, that'll do it. Uh, I'm Peter Graves in Vermont, and I see Abby is back on the screen, our executive director. Abby, do you want to close things out? I will. Thank you, Peter. That was wonderful. Thank you for helping put together this amazing group of panelists. I'm just grateful that you all could join us tonight um, and have this discussion uh, in support of the museum. Um, I really appreciate your time and spending your evening or, or early morning, whatever time it is, wherever you are. <laughs> with us. Um, and thank you all again for everyone that joined tonight in the audience. Don't forget that your donation could give me a pair of darn tough socks. Um, our next Red Bench is November 12th, so we've got a, about a month, um, and we'll be discussing backcountry skiing and riding and what effect COVID might have on the backcountry and resorts. Um, and that will do it for tonight. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Bye-bye, everyone. <laughs>